I'm Dan Finkel. Rich tasks are a fantastic way to build your students' capability as persevering problem solvers. With this one, you're definitely going to want to prepare and make sure you understand the central mystery at play here and how it works for your students. Now, you'll find that during the launch, students will think they understand it first, but then see that there's more to meet the eye. And that's exactly what's going to spark their curiosity and get them engaged in this problem. Ideally, there'll be enough there to keep them in productive struggle for the whole rest of the classroom until you're ready to wrap up. And in that wrap up, we'll give a sense of what they've learned and the kind of ownership that they've attained through this process. To launch, we define what squareable means. This isn't an important mathematics word, but it's useful for us today. A number is squareable if you can take that many squares and assemble them to form a larger square with no overlaps or holes. So for example, nine is squareable because we can take nine squares and build a bigger square out of them. Well, that's fine, but what about 13? Seems like there's no way that should be squareable. However, here is a way to take 13 squares, note that the sizes are different, and assemble them to make a bigger square. And as soon as students see this, they can see that there is more here than meets the eye. And right away, the question is so compelling, which is, all right, you know nine is squareable, you know 13 is squareable, what other numbers are squareable? In particular, I like to set the students just looking from one to 20, not getting too far out of control, and saying, which one of those can we actually make a picture of that exhibits that, that number is squareable, and which ones, for now, can we not do? Those we'll end up putting a bounty on, and really, that'll drive our search later. But for now, the students will be ready to go to work right away and dig into the productive struggle of engaging with this task. One of the best ways to get students started and really hooked into this problem is to encourage them to make conjectures. Which numbers do they think will be squareable and which numbers do they think won't be? The more evidence they get, the more compelled they'll be to change their answer or feel like they really had it right. Now, some students may have trouble even getting started. And for them, you really just wanna help them play around and draw examples of squareable numbers. If they can get even one number that they show is squareable, like I've shown seven is squareable here, that's a success and that can help them get more confidence and keep going. On the other hand, there may be other students who notice deeper patterns here. For example, students might notice that every time they break a square up into pieces, they add exactly three more squares on. There's seven, there's 10, there's 13. For those students, we really want to press them to make sure their arguments are clear and that they can describe what numbers they can get in this way and what numbers they still can't. Just having an assessment of where they are in the problem can help them continue to really polish it off and get control over the whole thing. To wrap up, it's usually best to start with a couple of concrete examples. This lets students who may have been a little more trepidatious to get started have a chance to share their success with the whole class. If people are ready, you can move to some of the bigger arguments. And these are things that students can share if they've come up with them. One that's very nice is to notice that by drawing a square, breaking one square up into four smaller squares, effectively adds three to the total number. So we go from one square to four squares, to seven squares, to 10 squares, and we get a list of numbers that are all squareable. This is quite nice. And if students can follow this, it actually amps up the power that they're able to get with this argument. We no longer have to just show one number at a time is squareable, we get a whole family of numbers. Another beautiful, beautiful argument that might happen is if students notice that by making one large square with small squares around the outside, they can get, say, six as a squareable number, then eight as a squareable number, and continue this argument to get all even numbers. If you combine these arguments, it's actually possible to show that all numbers are squareable except for two, three, and five. And that's really the finish of this problem. 
Your students may not get there all together, and don't worry if they don't. It's really more important if they have a sense of ownership and have developed as problem solvers, not if they've arrived at the full conclusion. This lesson may be worth spending more than one day on, and if some students finish early, a nice extension is to try triangulable numbers. That is, take an equilateral triangle and break it up into smaller equilateral triangles. Which numbers are triangulable? And that ends up being not just an analogous problem to this one, it actually ends up having the exact same answer, which is pretty interesting in its own right. As always, I've included the lesson plan in the description below, and please pass this on to teachers or others who might be interested. And if you try this with your class, please share in the comments, let me know how it went. I'm Dan Finkel, signing off.